One of the things that I'm attempting to do is cover different things, as I've stated. And spiritual perspectives, um, it's important to me that I share those on this YouTube channel. It's also important to me that I stay outside the box of scriptures, trying to define our reality in a fairly finite manner. And there's a lot of ways in which Orthodox religions do that. And I've been looking at different clues, as I've stated, for things that also resonate with the truth that I feel within. There's also times in which, for whatever reason, I may not read a book that everybody else is reading it when they're reading it because maybe I choose to avoid the crowds and maybe check it out 10 years later. Initially, when I hit record a couple minutes ago and then I hit stop, I started to read from Dion Fortune's Psychic Self-Defense, and then I stopped because the energy didn't feel quite right. There was a synchronicity in actually picking up this book by Ed Cartol. Tonight is the first night that I'll be sharing with you a segment, uh, some of his wisdom, and we're going to start reading here. And so I will go back and forth between literature, but instead of read the same material and recent videos... Uh, and I appreciate your support. I shared from the same book, and it's important to reflect on different perspectives, and the language flows a little bit easier, but there's some interesting references to Gnosticism as well in his own book. I've heard other people online speak of how he talks about the pain body. So a lot, like a lot of the wound up traumas and pains that we hold as human beings, talk about thought forms, there could be certain things that are unconsciously manifested by people that are uh, still affected by certain things to where there's like metaphysical repercussions, you know, to the point where it's like some of that stuff we have to take a very serious look at where we do have an ability to affect our world and our lives to a certain degree and we have to overcome certain challenges that we face in our lives. So apparently this author has helped a lot of people understand certain things and how through their own uh, breakdown, emotional or whatever in their own lives, there could be the breakthrough of the blossoming of the flower. So I'm going to center the conversation here on a couple passages. And I think this is where I was going to start, but there wasn't any set. Wasn't any set beginning wasn't any set end, you know, but just a need for it to flow. So on page five, is humanity ready for a transformation of consciousness, an inner flowering so radical and profound that compared to the flowering of plants, no matter how beautiful, it's only in a pale reflection. Can human beings lose the density of their conditioned mind structures and become like crystals or precious stones, so to speak, transparent to the light of consciousness? Can they defy the gravitational pull of materialism and rise above identification with form that keeps the ego in place and condemns them to imprisonment within their own personality? The possibility of such a transformation has been the central message of the great wisdom teachings of humankind, the messengers, Buddha, Jesus, and others. Not all of them known were humanity's early flowers. They were precursors, rare and precious beings. A widespread flowering was not yet possible at that time, and their message became largely misunderstood and often greatly distorted. It certainly did not transform human behavior except in a small minority of people. Is humanity more ready now than at the time of those early teachers? Why should this be so? What can you do, if anything, to bring about or accelerate this inner shift? What is it that characterizes the old, ogeic, egoic state of consciousness and by what signs is the new emerging consciousness recognized? These and other essential questions will be addressed in this book. More important, this book itself is a transformational device that has come out of the arising new consciousness. 
The ideas and concepts presented here may be important, but they are secondary. They are no more than signposts pointing towards awakening as you read a shift takes place within you. Now, I'll just pause. We've all re read our fair share of cliche New Age books, I'm sure. I haven't re read a lot of them. I've probably read more things in the conspiratorial end and came to my own understandings uh, spiritually. But this is a time that for a reason, I'm looking at certain things that have stood the test of time and have walked a certain way. There are, you see, there's a sea of, of people out there that are purporting to be spiritual. And like, we have to use a little bit of discretion, but certain people have put out certain ideas that have helped a lot of people. And I believe this is one of them. So let's, let's jump forward. Cause I don't want this to be stale for you or myself. I open this up at random and I saw this on page 16. Through some of those men and women schools or movements developed within all major religions that represented not only a rediscovery, but in some cases a intensification of the light of the original teaching. This is how Gnosticism and mysticism came into existence in early and medieval Christianity, Sufism, in the Islamic religion. And some of these are things, other words used or difficult to pronunciate. Kabbalah in Judaism, Zen in Buddhism, also Hinduism is mentioned. Most of these schools, I'm going to go down here, they did away with layers upon layers of deadening uh, conceptualization and mental belief structures. And for this reason, most of them were viewed with suspicion and often hostility by the established religious hierarchies. Unlike mainstream religion, their teachings emphasized realization and inner transformation. It is through those esoteric schools or movements that the major religions regained the transformative power of the original teachings, although in most cases, only in a small minority of people had access to them. Their numbers were never large enough to have a significant impact on the deep collective unconsciousness of the majority. Over time, some of those schools themselves became too rigid to remain effective. Spirituality and religion. What is the role of the established religions in the arising of the new consciousness? Many people are already aware of the difference between spirituality and religion. They realize that having a belief system, a set of thoughts that you regard as the absolute truth, does not make you spiritual, no matter what the nature of those beliefs is. In fact, the more you make your thoughts your identity, the more you are cut off from the spiritual dimension within yourself. Many religious people are stuck at that level. They equate truth with thought. And as they are completely identified with thought, their mind, they claim to be in sole possession of the truth in an unconscious attempt to protect their identity. They don't realize the limitations of thought. Unless you believe exactly as they do, you are wrong in their eyes. And in the not too distant past, they would have felt justified in killing you for that. And some still do, even now. I'm going to take a, take a breather because I have something to say in response to it. I, I'm reading that for the first time. Something told me that I should read that instead of that book. As I stated earlier, what I just read sounds a lot like what I was just saying earlier. So Alex Anser may have his own demeanor and mix in other things. Here's Ed Cartol, like famous book, famous book, like bestseller. And there's like a bunch of spiritual truths here. And yet I've come to my own like gnosis or truth, like my own awareness. I would talk about this earlier with some of the conspiracy truths that I came to earlier. And I would say like, wow, isn't it interesting that so many people around the world have come to their own truth regarding some of these things. Also spiritual truths. And it can be done on the unique level where it's not just, you know, everybody like following the leader. There are some people that choose to do that, 
But the real discovery, the real journey is an inward one where we literally are on the hunt for truth, looking within, but also out in the world, things that also help us remember clues, you know, so there's also a lot of information that's out there. Let's, let's skim ahead. But this was also a really good section. The new spirituality, the transformation of consciousness is arising to a large extent outside of the structures of the existing institutionalized religions. And again, in brief, I believe in the inner transformation of consciousness. And that's what he is saying we're focused on here, the inner. And we shouldn't be expecting the world to be conscious first before we start getting involved. Some people I feel have kind of done that. I feel like I've seen that in Portland and other places. Oh, man, the world's waking up. Or just these assumptions without people being a part of that and doing that, that inner work. Okay, so, you know, it's, it's a book with a lot of truth. He tells a little bit of his story here. Identification with the body. Apart from objects, another basic form of identification is with my body. Firstly, the body is male or female. And so the sense of being a man or woman takes up a significant part of people's sense of self. Ain't that the truth? Gender becomes identity. It could also create gender confusion. Uh, identification with gender is encouraged at an early age, and it forces you into a role, into conditioned patterns of behavior that affect all aspects of your life, not just sexuality. It's a role many people become completely trapped in, even more so in some of the traditional societies than in Western culture. You understand what he's getting at here, and for me, it's more the expectations, though, of particular genders. And that's what goes along with that with that identification. In the West, it is the physical appearance of the body that contributes greatly to the sense of who you think you are, its strength or weakness, its perceived beauty or ugliness relative to others. I would even say like ability to intelligently like work in like a sociopathic world, like work within it, whether it be creating your own business, functioning within it, going out to the nightclub or literally working for somebody else, but being alongside like and that requires like certain ability. Uh, for many people, their sense of self-worth is intimately bound up with their physical strength, good looks, fitness, and external appearance. External appearance. Many feel a, a diminished sense of self-worth because they perceive their body as ugly or imperfect. So in some cases, the mental image or concept of my body is a complete distortion of reality. A young woman may think of herself as overweight and therefore starve herself when in fact she is quite thin. Those who are, skipping forward, identified with their good lucks, physical strength or abilities experience suffering when those attributes begin to fade or disappear, as of course they will. So, yes, and coming back to the idea of aging gracefully and not even looking at even I'm doing it, you know, but it's it's a part of life. Sometimes we feel judged when we feel over the hill or at a certain age. And that's that identification with how society views that. The group of people at a certain age. And then we can take that on ourselves. So this is also something that's really key. So identifying with the true self versus the false self, feeling the inner body, forgetfulness of being. I'm sure this is all great. Um, but I don't want to skip anything forward. We're on page 74 now. In certain cases, you may need to protect yourself or someone else from being harmed by another. But beware of making it your mission to eradicate evil. As you are likely to turn into the very thing you're fighting against. Fighting unconsciousness will draw you into unconsciousness yourself. So that's psychic self-defense advice right there without it overtly being that. But some people could inadvertently bring things in on themselves 
for constantly being in these wars mentally. Then it can start on one level and there can be a lowering of defenses. Fighting unconsciousness will draw you into unconsciousness yourself. Unconsciousness, dysfunctional, egoic behavior can never be defeated by attacking it. Even if you defeat your opponent, the unconsciousness will simply have moved into you or the opponent reappears in a new disguise. It's like supernatural. It's like archonic. It would be like using our energy against us if we're in a lower state. Whatever you fight, you strengthen, and what you resist persists. And then he goes on here. I'm just going to say a few things, and then we're going to flip forward again. These days, you frequently hear the expression, the war against this or that. And whenever I hear it, I know that it is condemned to failure. There is the war against drugs, the war against crime, the war against terrorism, the war against cancer, the war against poverty, and so on. Of course, you know, like these comedy bits, all these comedy bits about all these false wars that have gone nowhere from Bill Hicks to many others. For example, despite the war against crime and drugs, there has been a dramatic increase in crime and drug-related offenses in the past 25 years. The prison population of the United States has gone up from just under 300,000 in 1980 to 2.1 million in 2004. The war against disease has given us, amongst other things, antibiotics. And goes on to discuss that. Let's go. Page 101. If you have young children, give them help, guidance, and protection to the best of your ability. But even more important, give them space, space to be. They come into this world through you, but they are not yours. The belief, I know what's best for you, may be true when they are very young, but the older they get, the less it becomes. The more expressions you have of how their life should unfold, the more you are in your mind instead of being present for them. Eventually, they will make mistakes and they will experience some form of suffering, as all humans do. In fact, there could be mistakes only from your perspective. What to you is a mistake may be exactly what your children need to do or experience. Give them as much help and guidance as you can, but realize that you may also at times have to allow them to make mistakes, especially as they are to begin to reach adulthood. <laughs> at times you may all, I'm thinking about a lot of things. At, at times you may have to allow them to suffer. Suffering may come to them out of the blue or it may come uh, as a consequence of their own mistakes. Conscious parenting. Moving forward, pathological forms of ego. Page one eighteen. So we'll 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 skim, and we'll cover even some things in the last chapter. As we've seen, the ego is in its essential nature pathological. If we use the word in its wider sense to denote dysfunction and suffering. Many mental disorders consist of the same egoic traits that operate in a normal person, except that they have become so pronounced in their pathological nature, it is now obvious to anyone except the person suffering. For example, many normal people tell certain kinds of lies from time to time in order to appear more important, more special, to enhance their image in the mind of others. How people use Instagram and Snapchat and Facebook comes to mind who they know, what their achievements, abilities, and possessions are. Even view counts on YouTube with some people. And whatever else the ego is used to identify with. Some people have are driven by the ego's feelings of insufficiency. And its need to have or be more. Um, lie habitually and compulsively. Most of what they tell you about themselves, their story is a fantasy, a fiction, designed for itself to feel bigger. The main element of the story is the belief that certain people, this also reminds me of some of the people that think that they may be victims of gang stalking, but it might be something else that may be taking place within their consciousness, 
but it may not be the people that they think. The main element of the story is the belief that certain people, sometimes large numbers or almost everyone, is plotting against me or conspiring to control or kill me. The story often has an inner consistency and logic so that it sometimes fools others into believing it too. Sometimes organizations or entire nations have paranoid belief systems at their very basis. Wow. We look at the last three years in my commentary about the disinformation, the alternative media, and I think that describes it. This book was written like, yeah, it's not comedy on current affairs. It's probably written like 2000 or, or something like that, the 90s. Um, the ego's fear and distrust of other people. Its tendency to emphasize the otherness. Illusions of separation uh, of others by focusing on their perceived faults and make those faults into their identity is taken a little further and makes others into inhuman monsters. By the way, we're on page 119. The ego needs others, but its dilemma is that deep down it hates and fears them. And ooh, deep breath. That's that's pretty heavy. Let people reflect on that. Remember when the war started in the Middle East? Like after the first Gulf War. It was the idea of like, hey, now our ego is boosted as Americans because we're at war again with those people after 9-11. Their ego is boosted. Ooh, now getting back after the towers were struck. Boost the ego after the ego had a many... Ooh, they manufactured the ego bruise. There were like so many like psychological repercussions of that event. It was bigger than just a surveillance of society and war. Like, like there, That was like a swipe at the ego. Of the collective American psyche. Okay, I'm, I'm taking this to another level. We know where this goes. We, we can look at brilliant spiritual information that doesn't go into conspiratorial, including Bruce Lipton and epigenetics, and apply it. We can apply it. By the way, don't forget to thumb up if you like this video. We can apply it to looking at the world as it is. If you particularly really enjoy videos like this, where I go through text like this, but also comment on current affairs, feel free to let me know. I am excited about taking my channel in a more, a deeper direction. It's not, it's not designed and it's not tagged and it's not SEO um, engineered <laughs> to be winning the lottery or to be going viral. It's pretty clear now that I have a core audience and what I believe in focusing on is what's most important. If I can attract more people to the channel, fine. But if there are certain limitations and my ego has attached itself to the growth of this channel, I know that I need to separate from that for my own spiritual growth and keep the spiritual message to the core about what this channel is. It's not about fighting anyone. It's not about numbers. The financial support that comes in allows me to do this. You make this possible because the AdSense really doesn't. So I want to thank you for that. Let you know there's links down below. Um, 127, ego comes about through the split in the human psyche with identity separating into two parts, which we can call I and me or me and myself. Every ego is therefore schizophrenic, to use the word in its popular meaning, of split personality. You live with mental image of yourself, a conceptual self that you have a relationship with. Life itself becomes conceptualized and separated from who you are when you speak of my life. The moment you say or think my life and believe in what you're saying, rather than it just being linguistic conversation, you've entered into the realm of delusion. And that's taken it to a deep level. I understand where that goes. Okay, 129. We are, this is the first time I'm, I'm going through this. So I heard someone reference this in another lecture. This, this needs its own video. Okay, that will be in due time. The greater part of most people's thinking is involuntary, automatic, and repetitive. It's no more than a kind of mental static and fulfills no real purpose. Um, the voice in the head has a life of its own. Most people are at the mercy of that voice. They are possessed. They are possessed. Do I hear an echo? Echo? No. <laughs> they are possessed by thought. They are possessed by the mind. And since the mind is conditioned by the past, 
you are then forced to reenact the past again and again. The Eastern term for this is karma. When you are identified with that voice, you don't know this, of course. If you knew it, you would no longer be possessed because you are only truly possessed when you mistake the possessing entity for who you are. That is to say, when you become it. Again, are your thoughts your own? Look at look at the modern modern uprising manufactured. And now is the group MMA with weapons. Yes, this is organic. Is the group thought the group think organic or was it directed? Is it a collective pain body as the ego was bruised in a manufactured event? Because don't think that the actual social engineers, whoever they are, human or beyond, don't have like this knowledge of the ego defensiveness, of the true nature of human spirituality, of the true plight of the soul. There's like a level of awareness potentially, like, you know, they may not be spiritual entities or good, but there may be like, oh, you know, these people have great potential. Them, let's distract them from their great potential and create all this pain and mental imagery for them to focus on so we can, you know, feed on that. So there, there's a deeper level to this. Going back for thousands of years, humanity has been increasingly mind-possessed. Oh, he's going deeper. <laughs> uh, failing to recognize, see, he doesn't have to say the Archon word, but he can go there without saying it directly and be like speaking code like. Uh, for thousands of years, humanity has been increasingly mind-possessed, failing to recognize the possessing entity as not-self. Through complete identification with the mind, a false sense of self, the ego, came into existence. The density of the ego depends on the degree to which you, the consciousness, is identified with your mind, with thinking. Thinking no more than a tiny aspect of the totality of consciousness, the totality of who you are. Okay. Going deeper, uh, the birth of emotion. The physical organism, your body, has its own intelligence, as does the organism of every other life form. And that intelligence reacts to what your mind is saying, reacts to your thoughts. So emotion is the body's reaction to your mind. The body's intelligence is, of course, an inseparable part of universal intelligence, one of its countless manifestations. It gives temporary cohesion to the atoms and molecules that make up your physical organism. It is the organizing principle behind the workings of all the organs of the body. The conversion of oxygen and food into energy, the heartbeat and circulation of the blood, the immune system that protects the body from invaders, the translation of sensory input into nerve impulses that are sent to the brain, decoded there and reassembled into a coherent inner picture of outer reality, all these as well, as thousands of other simultaneously occurring functions are coordinated perfectly by that intelligence. You don't run your body, the intelligence does. It is also in charge of the organism's responses to its environment. So take a long time to get through chapter. We know where he's getting at. It's changing also the body's reactive nature. Vipassana meditation, breathing, observing reality as it is, are certain exercises to get out of auto-reaction mode, auto-stress mode because of trauma, and then also ways to work through trauma. And there's ways, of course, that people could try to like make things better, and it could end up being worse. And if they don't know how to deal with things, they're going to activate their pain body. They can keep running into certain situations, and it goes deep, and I'm still learning. And I'm still having strange experiences that relate to things that are even within this book. So, and I think it relates to a lot of people that are listening. And it, this is also not going in such a directly, overtly Gnostic direction, but clearly very spiritual all along the way as well. It's interesting because I've come across these books before, like I said, his books. Uh, but I haven't really gotten into it until now. It says here, the intelligence gives rise to instinctive reactions of the organism to any threat or challenge. It produces responses in animals that appear to be akin to human emotions. Anger, fear, pleasure. 
these instinctive responses could be considered primordial forms of emotion. Indirectly, skimming forward, an emotion can also be a response to an actual situation or event, but it will be a response to the event seen through the filter of a mental interpretation, the filter of thought, that is to say, through the mental concepts of good and bad, like and dislike, me and mine. Okay. Just want to throw in something random. Is it Pavlov's dog? It's the association, like shocking the dog. Certain music, ringing the bell, association. They did that with 9-11 and that stage manufactured ego brews. And there are things that they bring out, that imagery, and also the boogeyman, the constant boogeyman, the boogeyman of the mentally ill American society, the boogeyman. But their ego to fight that boogeyman or to be in defense and to be victimized by the others. It, it's deep. It's deep. He's talking about spirituality and like showing, hey, this is where it is. We look at the opposite of that because we needed to do that when looking at spiritual texts and go, oh my gosh. And we're seeing like the society that's being led by mass consciousness is the opposite of these timeless spiritual teachings. Breaking free, page 161, first paragraph. Then we'll skip forward. The beginning of freedom from the pain body lies first in the realization that you have a pain body. Then, more importantly, in your ability to stay present enough, alert enough to notice the pain body in yourself as a heavy influx of negative emotion when it becomes active. When it is recognized, it can no longer pretend to be you and live and renew itself through you. I got to jump in here. You got to ground it out, identify it. Oh, that's not my thought. There's ways also you can clean out your head or your consciousness kind of filter out what's in there because there's a lot of energy in there in the monkey mind and there's certain techniques for doing that observing your thoughts and also clearing out your consciousness not channeling deities but clearing out your consciousness clearing out that which is clouded it is your consciousness presence that breaks the identification with the pain body and when you don't identify with it the pain body can no longer control your thinking and so cannot renew itself anymore by feeding on your thoughts. So by becoming aware of the fake news that's trying to manipulate our pain body, by becoming aware of the, the social media deception, by becoming aware of the YouTube algorithm, by becoming aware that there are other people that are following this fallen world that think their truth is, but they're not. You can incorporate this knowledge and see out there that there are things that are there to activate that pain body in the sense of victim consciousness within our society. And so there's a lot of wisdom here with regards to this. He uses the word clouded. I'm going to go back to the previous page. The pain body, in most cases, does not dissolve immediately, but once you have severed the link between it and your thinking, the pain body begins to lose energy. I am stressed, but so much of my life has been dedicated to this and, and so much of my time in recent years, nearly 90% of it has been directed towards this video series. There's some good that's come from it, right? Glad that you're here. There's also stress because I'm human. I mean, as I go deeper and do really deeper into my quest right now during this period in the quiet before the storm, I'm looking deeper for answers. I'm looking deeper for answers again in my own cycle, I guess, in my own life to the nature of suffering. I've always been on this path since I was a kid, an adolescent. Very unusual for a younger kid. Like we're talking like when I was 14 or 15 and being curious about meditation. Simple things, simple things. Deep breathing, uh, key exercises, chi. The softer side of the martial arts, even things like tai chi, but also, you know, being mesmerized by boxing, you know, and, and hard styles, but also things where there's a mix of the both, like Kung Fu, but seeing how even those movements and things where there's a mix of the both, there's something deeper. You know, I haven't lived in China. It would be interesting to learn more about some of the deeper philosophies behind some of those arts, but it's something that we're not really exposed to in the West, although you can seek it out. Um, there are some interesting uh, Qigong 
is also certain exercises can help with releasing pain and trauma would be a, a greater way to simplify it. Twisting from deep breathing with certain exercises with regards to meditation. Some people recommend putting yourself into a deep relaxed state by tightening certain muscles and, and kind of doing a scan throughout the body or going from one part of the body to the other. And then with Vipassana, it's pretty much doing a scan where you're observing your breath and you're not reacting, but you're doing a scan, an awareness scan of the body sensations from the feet, moving it up to the other areas. And also when I talk about the grounding, ground out the auric field, ground out, try to dissipate that pain body, all those stuck images and thoughts, it's energy. And in that, in the grounding, it's also focusing on the grounding, the different areas or parts going from the legs Feet moving up, legs, chest, torso, arms, head, grounding up the center of the head. And so certain things like that, uh, really taking ownership of our space. And a lot of people are telling us, oh, no, there is no space. There is no, none of that matters. None of that's real. None of that's important. None of that's worth thinking about. But then when you actually look at the real society and you look at the health, the actual health of some of these individuals that tell us that there's nothing spiritual about this world, who are they to be giving us advice? Who are us to be listening to them? Why? It's the power of suggestion, and it'll be there as long as we're going to be open to it. The question is, are we going to be open to it? But the, the mockery, whether it be family members of yours or your spouse, it's going to be there. If you're on a spiritual awakening, Somebody that you're straight up, and I'm not here to tell you what to do or knock anything, but the reality is, like, you can come down to, like, somebody in your relationship that you're, like, with that's, like, going to mock you because uh, you may be going in a certain direction. You may be having a spiritual experience. You may be changing as a person. I'm not going to start doing karaoke. <laughs> you know, we're not going to be bringing on the heartbreak tonight. You know, but the greater reality is, is there's going to be times in which people are in relationships and some people aren't going to be down with going deep into what we're really doing here. What's really going on with the government? And, you know, a lot of people need to wake up to that level. The reason why is they may need to step back from the government or supporting certain politicians or even being online and consuming some of this alternative media content. So it's highly negative. And I'll tell you what, that sounds like romance when you have two people that are on a similar wavelength. But, and I'm just going to say this, having not been in a ton of relationships in this life, but maybe suspecting that my soul has some sort of retained knowledge. There's purpose in opposites attracting. And, and sometimes one person be on the spiritual path and the other person not. Sometimes they are kind of brought together to learn from each other. Um... So on page 163, many acts of violence are committed by normal people who temporarily turn into maniacs. All over the world at court proceedings, you hear the defense lawyers say, this is totally out of character. I don't know what came over me. You know, though, that even though there are some people that supported Trump early on when he was running and they went out to do certain things, there's a number of people while in court have tried to blame Trump on their actions when they need to be taking accountability, even if they felt inspired for some reason by something that was said. They are the ones to take responsibility for their actions. There's a couple of court proceedings right now where people are externalizing the blame for what they did. To my knowledge so far, no defense lawyer has said to the judge, although the day may not be far off, this is a case of a diminished responsibility. My client's pain body was activated and he did not know what he was doing. In fact, he didn't do it at all. His pain body did. So, of course, that's the reality of the situation, but it's not an excuse. He goes on, does this mean that people are not responsible for what they do when possessed by the pain body? It's like echoing what I just said. My answer is, how can they be? How can you be responsible when you are unconscious when you don't know what you are doing. However, in the greater scheme of things, human beings are meant to evolve into conscious beings. And those who don't will suffer the consequences of their unconsciousness. They are out of alignment with their evolutionary impulse of the universe. So the key is, like, we shouldn't be so out of balance because of the pain body that we're just acting out. And there are, there are 
Ooh, go deep into this one. Mass media mind control. The promotion of the guys that act out. Look at the look at the so-called professional wrestling. Now, certain things that are promoted in our culture promote this maniac behavior. Would you not say so? Monkey see, monkey do. I'll just continue. And even that one is only relatively true. From a higher perspective, it is not possible to be out of alignment with the evolution of the universe. And even human unconsciousness and the suffering it generates is part of that evolution. When you can't stand the endless cycle of suffering anymore, you begin to awaken. So the pain body too has its necessary place in the larger picture. I have a blog from 2009. It's through the pain that we can find the way home. And that is at alexansory.tv. Now we're on page 192. Knowing yourself and knowing about yourself. You may not want to know yourself because you are afraid of what you might find out. Many people have a secret fear that they are bad, but nothing you can find out about yourself is you. Nothing you can know about you is you. While some people do not want to know who they are because of fear, others have a curiosity about themselves and want to find out more and more. You may be so uh, fascinated with yourself that you spend years in psychoanalysis and delve into every aspect of your childhood, uncover secret fears and desires, and find layers upon layers of complexity in the makeup of your personality and character. After 10 years, the therapist may get tired of you and your story and tell you that your analysis is now complete. Perhaps he sends you away with a 5,000-page uh, book. This is all about you. This is who you are, end quote. As you carry the heavy file home, the initial satisfaction of at least knowing yourself gives way quickly to a feeling of incompleteness and a lurking suspicion that there must be more to you than this. And indeed, there is more. Not perhaps in quantitative terms of more facts, but in the qualitative dimension of depth. There is nothing wrong with psychoanalysis or finding out about your past as long as you don't confuse knowing about yourself with knowing yourself. The 5,000-page book is about yourself, the content of your mind which is conditioned by the past. Whatever you learn through psychoanalysis or self-observation is about you, but it's not you. It is content, not essence. Going beyond ego is stepping out of content. Knowing yourself is being yourself, and being yourself is ceasing to identify with content. Most people define themselves through the content of their lives. Whatever you perceive, experience, do, think, or feel is content. Content is what absorbs most people's attention entirely, and it is what they identify with. What is there other than content? That which enables the content to be the inner space of consciousness. I'll just take a breather there. What is there other than content? That which enables the content to be the inner space of consciousness chaos and higher order when you know yourself only through content you will also think you know what is good or bad for you you differentiate between events that are good for me and those that are bad this is a fragmented perception of the wholeness of life in which everything is interconnected in which every event has its necessary place and function within the totality we're not done yet just to pause so also good uh, luck, bad luck is a Chinese parable. And I won't read the whole thing, you know, but there's a horse and the horse comes back and the villagers say to the old man, what, what good luck you have? I mean, good luck, bad luck, sense of neutrality because you don't really know. And the horse um, runs away. They say it's bad luck. Good luck, bad luck, who knows? Brings back a bunch of stallions. Villagers say it's great luck. Good luck, bad luck, who knows? His son gets on some of the horses, tries to uh, tame them, falls off, break his leg. Oh, what, what suffering? What bad luck? 
Good luck, bad luck. Do we really know? Then the army comes to draft his son for the war, but they spare him because he has a broken leg. So he's not going to die in that war. He's been spared because he has a broken leg. Good luck, bad luck. Doesn't it seem to change? That's like a pretty fast breakdown of the Chinese parable about staying out of judgment, whether something is good or bad for us. I've seen so many examples of this in my own life. We're going to jump forward. So we were at one page 194. The joy of being. Unhappiness or negativity is a disease on our planet. What pollution is on the outer level is negativity on the inner. It is everywhere, not just in places where people don't have enough, but even more so when they have more than enough. Is that surprising? No. The affluent world is even more deeply identified with form, more lost in content, more trapped in ego. People believe themselves to be dependent on what happiness or what happens for their happiness. That is to say, dependent on form. And I never said I'm perfect. I think this book has a lot of great things that apply to me. We're not, we're not perfect beings. We're humans. And hopefully through the spiritual information that's out there, we're collectively helping each other work ourselves up to a higher level of consciousness and awareness. This is pretty deep material. They look upon the present moment as either marred by something that has happened or shouldn't have or as deficient because of something that has not happened but should have. And let me talk about the pain body and something else that I perceive about that because we need to be able to keep that stuff in check. There could be like something happening. We're going to skip forward to 223 where it seems like the pain body is activated and it's like your anxiety is activated and it's like your panic is activated and you don't really need that pill. You don't really need to find a reason for it, but your mind might be looking going, is there something that I need to be aware of? And there might be something there, but it might be a part of our unconsciousness pain body that's trying to recreate that sensation going, okay, it's time to be afraid now. It's time to be in anxiety now. And we may not necessarily have a picture for what it is, but it may be there somewhere in the unconsciousness acting on autopilot acting on autopilot kind of like an involuntary muscle seemingly an involuntary thought or say a thought that's been let run awry it needs to be reeled back in and grounded out through special techniques that i think literally have to do with a lifetime of research i'm not talking about rituals and spells and do to do abacadabra <laughs> i'm just talking about like zoning in and mastering this mind body spirit temple which was given to us, which some people take for granted, but it's capable of much more. As he said, many believe, I can do many things, but you can do more, or something to that effect, a quote attributed to Jesus. The discovery of inner space, 223. According to an ancient Sufi story, there lived a king in some Middle Eastern land who was continuously torn between happiness and uh, another lower emotion, the, uh, the slight thing would cause him great upset or provoke a intense reaction, and his happiness would quickly turn into disappointment and despair. A time came when the king finally got tired of himself and his life and he began to seek a way out. He sent for a wise man who lived in his kingdom and who was reputed to be enlightened. When the wise man came, the king said to him, I want to be like you. Can you give me something that would bring balance, serenity, and wisdom into my life? I will pay any price that you ask. The wise man said, I may be help, able to help you, but the price is so great that your entire kingdom would not be a sufficient payment for it. Therefore, it will be a gift to you if you will honor it. The king gave his assurances, and the wise man left. A few weeks later, he returned and handled the king a box carved in jade. The king opened the box and found a simple gold ring inside. He found his precious. No, just, some letters were inscribed on the ring. The inscription read, this too will pass. What is the meaning of this? Asked the king. I've actually said this phrase to myself recently. The wise man said, wear this ring always. Whatever happens before you call it good or bad, touch this ring and read the inscription. That way you will always be at peace. I got to pause. Stretch out my fingers a little bit.
Do we live in a world where the collective mass media mind control mechanisms are they are they telling us this too shall pass? Or are we getting the meme this is the end? Beautiful friend, this is the end with very articulate detail and a great amount of evidence. I'll say this. If something like the sun does something to affect our grid, it's because something's allowed to happen on a larger level, a larger level. There could be deceptions with attempts to take down our grid. I'm not denying that. But on a larger, larger level. But I think it's ridiculous when I hear articles talking about like a solar attack where the sun is attacking the earth. The sun doesn't attack the earth. The sun gives the earth life. And those beings on the earth life. The sun doesn't attack the earth. Now, if the humans on the ground want to go in an unconscious direction and go away from the sun, respecting the sun and worship the nuclear grid, worship the burning of coal, worship the raping of this earth. Well, that's the path that they're going to go on. But you know what? And, you know, this comes to me a lot because I live off the grid. You know, the ancients or just those a couple hundred years ago, they had a lot more respect for the sun when it came up. And the sun in general, before they had a grid. The grid, if you will, and I think there's maybe even some deeper things about electricity, and, and maybe a, an element of it being very unnatural for us to be living alongside certain grids. I've gone deeper in that in other videos. There can even be a conduit of spirits that are trapped in the electric grid. I know that I had dreams about that in Portland. And I talked about that after I had that dream. It was when I was sleeping in my vehicle was that a home in that year that I went back to Portland, 2014 to 2015 era. And I knew that I was meant to learn something about humility but also about my strength to rise from what seemed to be a really weak state where I really hit, felt hit by life to crawl out of that and get back up. It's not how hard you hit. It's how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. I continued my show on Access TV. And so there was a sense of needing to go beyond that ego. It wasn't easy. And there's parts in which I've gone back and forth. So there's, there's times in which we have kind of a stronger grasp on it on our lower senses. There could be other times where there could be certain emotional tides and I would say full moons and solar flares that can bring out certain emotions and we maybe need to be, be aware of that and ground it out and do our inner work. So there's going to be times where our unresolved stuff's going to flare up and it'll be manifested. Or times where we're maybe even dealing with the interference, however one perceives it. Um, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. We're in a cycle of time. This too shall pass. We're going to be another cycle. There's going to be benefits and challenges to the next solar cycle. There are certain benefits and challenges, certain good things that are happening, and certain things that could per be perceived to be negative. It, it, it's a little bit relative, though, and we were just discussing kind of staying out of that. But if you look at the totality of our lifetimes, we're going through a series of ups and downs where this too shall pass. This also includes, I'm going to add this. Guys in a great relationship with a girl, this too shall pass, possibly. Don't become too attached. Enjoy it for the moment, but don't grasp. Don't grasp. Don't force. Allow the freedom to be what it is and appreciate while one has one's love. And, and, and taking this philosophy deep into our lives and our interactions for others. We're grateful for the things. Donations could be an example. Other things, other help can be an example. Grateful for it. But we should also be dependent on it or always assume that it would be there or that someone will be there or in our lives. Again, back to certain relationships. This too shall pass. And there could be another moment where it's still going on, but this too shall pass and we enter into another moment. We need to re remember to be present. Moving along here, he has a section on television. Watching television is the favorite leisure activity or rather non-activity for millions of people around the world. The average American, by the time he is 60 years old, will have spent 15 years staring at the TV screen. In many other countries, the figures are similar. They find it relaxing. 
Observe yourself closely and you will find that the longer the screen remains the focus of your attention, the more your thought activity becomes suspended. And for long periods, you are watching the talk show, game show, sitcom, or even commercials with almost no thought being generated by your mind. Not only do you not remember your problems anymore, but you're coming temporarily free of yourself. And what could be more relaxing than that? So does TV watching create inner space? Does it create you to be present? Unfortunately, it does not. And I think everything that was just said there applies straight up to YouTube. But you could be watching something on YouTube or downloading something or making it a podcast like at onlinevideoconverter.com. Take your favorite MP3 or video like this. Listen to an MP3 in your podcast while you're running. If it's beneficial to you and you're not becoming a zombie, then awesome. But the potential for people to be zombified on YouTube as well as TV, oh, it's totally there. Look at all that mainstream gunk that's on the front page of news. Oh, how YouTube's front page has changed. <laughs> Remember also that, that commercial with Alec Baldwin about, like, he was joking about the reptilians eating or sucking out the human brains? Because of reptilians, yo. <laughs> the, the Alec Baldwin reptilian ad for Hulu. That was, what, four years ago, five years ago, maybe a little bit longer? The mind is absorbing thoughts and images that come through the TV screen. There's a mind control element to that. He's not getting to that, but you can learn way deep about this. And also, I mentioned again earlier, not to say it's just these guys. There's plenty of other guys with great info. Just citing well-known people that you might be able to reference and then learn from them. Even on a level where they don't even intend. Bruce Lipton, epigenetics. So if we're programmed to be in fear and we're programmed to think certain ways, it's going to have a certain effect on the body and on reality in the way that epigenetics works. The repercussions for that could be deep. Social engineers that are trying to change the genetics of human society could create traumatic events like 9-11 and become basically, I'm going deep, I didn't mean to, I'm sorry, but genetically engineer basically a bee society that becomes more and more warlike and, and immersed with technology. Seems like we're on that path in the post 9-11 world and a lot of technology for them to play with, not only to merge with, but to test overseas. So a lot of the TV has been programming people with these images. And uh, it seems like it has a supernatural overtone. I know that makes some people go, you know, but I think there's definitely a purpose why we've, we've gone through this type of hypnotic trance. Now, the synchronicity that happens a lot is I'll say a word right as I look down at the word and see that it's the same thing or say something as it's on the radio. So as I look down, the next word of the sentence is, regarding the TV, this induces a trance-like passive state of heightened susceptibility, not unlike hypnosis. That is why it lends itself to manipulation of public opinion. As politicians... And special interest groups, as well as advertisers, know and will pay millions of dollars to catch you in that state of receptive unawareness. They want their thoughts to become your thoughts, and usually they succeed. Now, I'm not going to keep going, but this is amazing material. We're going to keep going to the next chapter, Your Inner Voice. And then we have a new earth, and then uh, we'll call it a night. Please check out the links down below and support this channel. Let me know if you love specialized content like this. That is... That sentence right there. I already moved forward. Um, there's, there's much more to get into this, this chapter, the discovery of inner space. Yeah, but check out my TV mind control article from 2005. I also have it over at Alex Hansery, uh Dot TV. So when not watching TV, let me just read something else. The tendency is for you to fall below thought, not rise above it. Television has this in common with alcohol and certain other drugs, which can weaken your field. While it provides some relief from your mind, you again pay a high price loss of consciousness. Like those drugs, it too has a strong addictive quality. You reach for the remote control to switch off and instead find yourself going through all the channels or binge watching certain types of videos that aren't very truthful that have a candy type of dopamine rush to them because they hit the right fear buttons. 
It's true. There is an addictive nature to certain tones of dark elements of content because of the buttons that they're hitting, the instincts. It is like a form of sexual performance art. Some of the emotional drama and war talk that's on YouTube. And they're mirroring these primal, unresolved issues in the collective. Well, this is deep. And so TV can bring that out. And with a collective event, the whole world watches like 911. The world can be put in that hypnotic trance. Okay. Lose yourself, define yourself. Awakening is a shift in consciousness in which thinking and awareness is separate. For most people, it is not an event, but a process they undergo. Even those rare beings who experience a sudden, dramatic, and seemingly irreversible awakening will still go through a process in which the new state of consciousness gradually flows into and transforms everything that they do and becomes integrated in their lives. Instead of being lost in your thinking, when you are awake, you recognize yourself as the awareness behind it. I haven't actually finished Dan Millman's Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I've read it as well as well as uh, another book called Surfing the Himalayas. I should check that out. But both of those have very similar themes. But there is a lot of themes with Socrates telling Dan Millman to get out of his mind. And then, of course, we have the Free Your Mind Conference and the theme behind that. So the mind is a tool, but it has its limitations. So let's read A New Earth from page 279 and conclude. I want to thank you for tuning in and liking. Astronomers have discovered evidence to suggest that the universe came into existence 15 billion years ago and a gigantic explosion has been expanding ever since. Not only has it been expanding, but it's been growing in complexity and becoming more and more differentiated. Some scientists also uh, postulate that this movement from unity to multiplicity will eventually become reversed. The universe will then stop expanding and begin to contract again and finally return to the unmanifested, the unconceivable nothingness out of which it came. <laughs> There's different ways to interpret that too. And perhaps repeat the cycles of birth, expansion, contradiction, and death again. For what purpose? Why art thou? We stuck in this matrix. Why does the universe go to all the bother of existing? Asked physicist Stephen Hawking, realizing at the same time that no mathematical model could ever supply the answer. If you look rather within than only without, however, you discover that you have an inner and an outer purpose. And since you are a microcosm, a reflection of the macrocosm, a micro of the macro. Sound familiar? It follows that the universe too has an inner and an outer purpose inseparable from yours. The outer purpose of the universe is to create form and experience the interaction of forms, the play, the dream, the drama, or whatever you choose to call it. Its inner purpose is to awaken to its formless essence. This comes the reconciliation of the outer and the inner purpose. Now, pause. I was discussing how other people were putting out civil war propaganda, saying there can be no reconciliation. We're way beyond that point. And I was alluding to that's putting out like mind control, negative thought forms, trying to program an audience. Whereas like from the micro to the macro, we need to have balance and reconciliation between ourselves, but also within the world. And there are those forces that don't have that balance within themselves and individuals that are also promoting and supporting the illusions of separation. The root of the cause problem was within themselves that led to being diluted into some of these extreme groups. It started with a personal breakdown. So you have to understand that some of the people that are involved in left and white extremism and violent rhetoric can't be helped by us. We can't just wake them up. They have to have their own gnosis and awakening. They have to have their own spiritual experience, not religious. They have to have their own quest for their own inner truth and power. Sometimes life needs to beat us up a little bit till we really look for that or put ourselves in situations, whether it be off grid or other, we all go our own paths. Some choose religion. I have not. But there are things in which we may put ourselves in a rite of passage learning situation, as I feel I did with Costilla County in order to 
fill ourselves with that spiritual essence when we abandon the physical materialism. And that was a big theme of mine from 2012 to 2013. It was only nine months, but it felt like it was significant, my purpose in going there. And it seemed like maybe I was meant to go through that without the internet. It was really difficult and complicated not to have the internet there. It's great to have it now. Sometimes the internet and the images, literally on the internet and thought forms, can distract us away from the the divine within and the divine around us in nature, the trees, the sky, the sun, the earth. I have a lot of stories that I almost feel like almost diving into, but more synchronicity with what I was saying and what's on the next page. Uh, As an illustration of relative, an absolute truth, consider the sun rise and the sun set. When we say that the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening, that is true, but only relatively. In absolute terms, it is false. Only from the limited perspective of an observer. On or near the planet's surface does the sun rise or set. If you were far out in space, you would see that the sun neither rises nor sets, but that it shines continuously. And I'll see you on the dark side of the moon. (laughs) And yet, even after realizing that, we can continue to speak of the sunrise or sunset, still see its beauty, paint it, write poems about it, even though we now know that it is a relative rather than an absolute truth. Wow. (laughs) On that note, on that note, there is a book that was uh, at least co-authored by Roger Waters, and it's called Which One's Pink? And there's things that I identify with that are in a lot of the lyrics from Pink Floyd. For copyright reasons, we can't, uh, and this is stuff really like even before 911, me looking at Pink Floyd and the spiritual message, even within the wall. There's a book called Which One's Pink? And it gets in elements of the wall, but I haven't found it online. Let me know if you know where it's at. There is a college paper where a college kid is interpreting elements of the book and going a little deeper into the Dark Side of the Moon album and the references to the passing of time and the trappings of time or Kronos which is also a part of the spiritual understanding of going beyond time and space. And so there's things that are very Gnostic and leaning in the lyrics of Roger Waters, an American rock and roll album. There is truth in a lot of his lyrics. So in a future video, in a future reading, I'm going to go through some of that where we will read through the lyrics from the dark side of the moon and also wish you were here. Uh, Also money and time and reflect on the spiritual messages, the Gnostic truth, as coming from Roger Waters of the group Pink Floyd. Awakening and the return moment, which is, in a person's life, the weakening or dissolution of form, whether through old age, illness, disability loss, or some kind of personal tragedy, carries great potential for spiritual awakening the disidentification of consciousness from form. Since there is very little spiritual truth in our contemporary culture, not many people recognize this as an opportunity. So when it happens to them or someone close to them, they think that there is something dreadfully wrong that should not be happening. There is in our civilization a great deal of ignorance about the human condition. And the more spiritually ignorant you are, the more you suffer. For more people, particularly in the West, death is no more than an abstract concept. And so they have no idea what happens to the human form when it approaches dissolution. Recently, I mentioned the Egyptian Book of the Dead and other things of interest with regards to that. What is lost on the level of form is gained on the level of essence. Awakening the outgoing movement. And by the way, give me just one second.
Sometimes the machines in this part of Colorado sound like straight up monsters from another planet. It's like, oh my God, that is a generator from hell. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Until now, human intelligence, which is no more than a minute aspect of universal intelligence, has been distorted and misused by the ego. I call that intelligence in the service of a madness. Splitting the atom requires great intelligence. Using that intelligence for building and stockpiling atomic weapons is insane. See, I thought he was going to go in a more cheesy direction in the newer chapter. He's, he's still keeping it real, y'all, without getting straight up conspiratorial. He's speaking in code. We can learn something. Um, stupidity is relatively harmless, but intelligent stupidity is highly dangerous. This intelligent stupidity for which one could find countless obvious examples is threatening our survival as a species. Without the impairment of the egoic dysfunction, our intelligence comes in full alignment with the outgoing cycle of universal intelligence and its impulse to create. We become conscious participants in the creation of form, cloning. It is not who we create, but universal intelligence that creates through us. We don't identify with what we create, so we don't lose ourselves in what we do. We are learning that the act of creation, I just let the cat in, may involve energy of the highest intensity, but that is not hard work or stressful. It is not hard work or stressful. Kitty, you're in the picture. The force behind the ego's wanting creates enemies. That is to say, reaction in the form of a opposing force. Equal in intensity. The stronger the ego, the stronger the sense of separateness between people, which we covered a little bit of detail. Wow. Consciousness is already conscious. It is the unmanifested, the eternal, the universe. However, it is only gradually becoming conscious. Consciousness itself is timeless and therefore does not evolve. It was never born and it does not die. When consciousness becomes the manifested universe, it appears to be subject to time and to undergo an evolutionary process. No human mind is capable of comprehending fully the reason for this process, but we can glimpse it within ourselves and become a conscious participant in it. Consciousness is the intelligence, the organizing principle behind the arising of form. Consciousness has been preparing forms for millions of years so that it can express itself through them in the manifested. Although the unmanifested realm of pure consciousness could be considered another dimension, it is not separate from this dimension of form. Form and formlessness are impenetrable or inseparable. Um, the unmanifested flows into this dimension as awareness, inner space, and presence. Through the human form that becomes conscious and thus fulfills its destiny. The human form was created for this higher purpose. And millions of other forms prepared the ground for it. And it goes on. There are three ways in which consciousness can flow into what you do and thus through you in this world. Three modalities in which you can align your life with the creative power of the universe. The underlying energy frequency that flows into what you do and connects your actions with the awakened consciousness that is emerging into this world. Acceptance. Whatever you cannot enjoy doing, you can at least accept that this is what you have to do. Acceptance means for now, this is the situation, the moment requires me to do, and I do so willingly. Imagine yourself in a survival situation. You got to reach a certain level of acceptance, not panic, and then uh, go about being an action hero with a certain level of acceptance that you got some challenges. Uh, doing cliff notes here, enjoyment, the peace that comes with surrendered action turns to a sense of aliveness when you actually enjoy what you are doing. I want to keep doing that. I want to keep enjoying what I do with the video thing, not let the shadow banning and the censorship and the limited economics change the general overall dynamics to it. 
uh, uh, the peace that comes with surrendered action turns to a sense of aliveness. Uh, enjoyment is the second modality of awakened doing. On the new earth, enjoyment will replace wanting as the motivating power behind people's actions. So when he talks about new earth, he's not making necessarily like a prediction that a planet's going to like erupt and like float us off. It sounds very hypothetical. Like on a new earth, like I say, planet B on a more conscious where they're using like their full global structure. I'm starting to talk more like that and use my imagination. I think it's coming from a place that's almost like this, or it is this place without me using necessarily Ed Cartol's language. There is a place where there's more mindful relationships. There's more peace for this type of strife. It doesn't seem so uh, natural. It's, it's different. But it's not a place for everyone. And this place, even the suffering, may have its purpose. On a deeper level in the spiritual traditions, there is the discussions of the earth realms. We even had a person in the chat recently, earth is hell. That's a Gnostic view, and it's the understanding of a fallen world. So things go down here. But we still idolize and almost keep in our mind the new earth, the world that is higher than this, or a world that is higher than this, or better than this, where people are more conscious, because we identify with that. And by doing so, thus we manifest ourselves into that new earth, potentially. But it's beyond this lifetime, I believe. I don't think it's meant to be taken literally in the form of spacecrafts that literally take us to the new earth in a particular year. But are there spinoffs that are maybe playing on the spiritual truth that have misled people in our day and age, especially in ufology and the UFO movement? And Stephen Greer, oh, reach out and touch me. You know, all the type of propaganda to be close to the aliens, the Lady Gaga and the Katy Perry ET. Now I'm just kind of going off with it. Um, there are ways in which... We, people have been misled. And we have to connect with that spiritual kingdom of Fantasia or whatever we might recognize it. Even the never-ending story has a lot of spiritual allegories from the passing of the gate, but to also the nothingness and it devouring this beautiful place. The beautiful place in the movie that was absorbed by the nothingness, the emptiness, when people stopped dreaming. And also in the never-ending story, and maybe through a use of a misuse of magic or magi, Atreyu in the never-ending story too was convinced by the witch that was trying to direct him off his path to make particular witches with some sort of a particular tool. Those wishes manifested and he lost his memories. And that seemed to be almost some sort of symbolism for a misuse of energy. And there are ways in which people can misuse their energy with their desires and what they manifest and why. And whether they're manifesting for something good or whether they're manifesting for something selfish or whether they're choosing to uh, run away from a certain level of self-responsibility and self-reliance and whether they're entangling their energies with something else that's going to do something for them, but it may come with a courting or a consequence or in that movie, The Losing of a Memory, which is identified with the, you know, the disillusion of the identified with his truth of, of his mission to the point where the goal of the witch was so that he lost so many memories that he forgot why he was there after her and became someone that was subjected to her control. Now I'm going to read from page 299 here and we are almost at the end. Here is a spiritual practice that will bring empowerment and creative expansion into your life. Make a list of a number of everyday routine activities that you perform frequently and include activities that you may consider uninteresting, boring, tedious, irritating, or stressful. But don't include anything that you hate or detest doing. That's a case either for acceptance or for stopping what you do. The list may include traveling to and from work, buying groceries, I'm going to skim forward a little bit. Be absolutely present in what you do and sense the alert. Alive and stillness within you in the background of the activity. You will soon find that what you do in such a state of heightened awareness, instead of being stressful, is to become, or is for the experience to become enjoyable. 
to be more, which sounds a little odd in such an unenjoyable world, unenjoyable world. But, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of, of personal intent to change one's physiology and how we're experiencing this reality for the benefit of our own health and epigenetics. To be more precise, what you are enjoying is not really the outward action, but the inner dimension of consciousness that flows into the action. This is the finding the joy of being in what you are doing. If you feel your life lacks significant or is too stressful or tedious, it's because you haven't brought that dimension into your life yet. I may not be able to travel right now or have the money, but I try to bring in that, that divine spark of inspiration while I live here, sometimes living a tedious life. Uh, the new earth arises as more and more people discover that their main purpose in life is to bring the light of consciousness into this world and so use whatever they do as a vehicle for consciousness. Sometimes we can learn some things from others. The joy of being is the joy of being conscious. Awakened consciousness then takes over from ego and begins to run your life. You may then find that a activity that you've been engaged in for a long time naturally begins to expand into something much bigger when it becomes empowered by consciousness. I want to see my channel empowered even more by consciousness than it already has, and for it to result in some positive experiences by as a result of what I put out. Some of those people who, through creative action, enrich the lives of many others simply do what they enjoy doing mostly without wanting to achieve or become anything through that activity. They may be musicians, artists, writers, scientists, teachers, or builders. Or they may bring into manifestation new social or business structures. Sometimes for a few years, their sphere of influence remains small, and then it can happen suddenly or gradually. A wave of creative empowerment flows into what they do, and their activity expands beyond anything they could have imagined and touches countless others. In addition to enjoyment, an intensity is now added to what they do, and with it comes a creativity that goes beyond anything an ordinary human could accomplish. But don't let it go to your head, because up there is where a remnant of ego may be hiding, because people could actually achieve something and then see their own downfall because of it going to their head. Uh, you are still an ordinary human. What is extraordinary is what comes through you into this world. But that essence you share with all beings. The 14th century Persian poet and Sufi master Hafiz expresses this truth beautifully, quote, I am a hole in the flute that the Christ's breath moves through. Listen to this music. Enthusiasm. Then there is another way of creative manifestation that may come to those who remain true to their inner purpose of awakening. Suddenly one day they know what their outer purpose is. They have a great vision, a goal, and from then on they work towards implementing that goal. Their goal or vision is usually connected in some way to something on a smaller scale they're doing and enjoy doing already. This is where the third modality of awakened doing arises, enthusiasm. Deep enjoyment in what you do plus the added element of a goal or a vision that you work toward. Unlike stress, enthusiasm has a high energy frequency and so resonates with the creative power of the universe. This is why Ralph Waldo Emerson said, quote, nothing great that has ever been achieved has ever been achieved without enthusiasm. The word enthusiasm comes from an ancient Greek and and theos meaning God, and the related word. Well, this is enough. Uh, enthusiasm means to be possessed by a god. With enthusiasm, you will find that you don't have to do it all by yourself. In fact, there is nothing of significance that you can do by yourself. Sustained enthusiasm brings into existence a wave of creative energy, and all you have to do then is ride the wave. Why does this sound so familiar? And that's kind of how I coined today. This is my pull the whistle, pull the pull the trucker, uh, pull the pull the trucker horn. This is my third video of the day. 
and that doesn't always happen and there's usually not this much content. And I wanted to complete the day with a spiritual message and I read more than I planned to. All this implies that your goal or vision is then already a reality within you on a level of mind and feeling. Enthusiasm is the power that transforms the mental blueprint into the physical dimension. That is the creative use of mind. And that is why there is no wanting involved. You cannot manifest what you want. You can only manifest what you already have. You may get what you want through hard work and stress, but that is not the way of the new earth. Jesus gave the key of the creative use of the mind and of the conscious manifestation of form when he said, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Last few pages, the frequency holders, page 306. The outward movement into form does not express itself with equal intensity in all people. Some feel a strong urge to build, create, become involved, achieve, make an impact upon the world. If they are unconscious, their ego will, of course, takes over and uses the energy of the outgoing cycle for its own purposes. This, however, also greatly reduces the flow of the creative energy available to them and increasingly they need to rely on efforting to get what they want. If they are conscious, those people in whom the outward movement is strong will be highly creative. Others, after the natural expansion that comes with growing up has run its course, lead an outwardly unremarkable, seemingly more passive and relatively uneventful existence. They are more inward looking by nature. For them, the outward movement into form is minimal. They would rather return home than go out. They have no desire to get strongly involved in or change the world. Okay, others may uh, become dropouts and live on the uh, outskirts of society. They feel they have little in common with. Others eventually become healers or spiritual teachers. That is to say, teachers of being. In past ages, they would probably have been called contemplatives. There is no place for them, it seems, in our contemporary civilization. On the arising new earth, what are you going to tell me now? Nice guys don't finish last. On the, on the arising new earth, however, their role is just as vital as that of the creator's. The doers, the reformers, their function is to anchor the frequency of the new consciousness on this planet. I call them the frequency holders. Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> they are here to generate consciousness through the activities of daily life, through their interactions with others, as well as through just being. Just being. And maybe for others, traveling. Traveling the nation. Sharing their knowledge with people around the nation. And there's value in that. There's value in physically traveling. That is the path for some for a reason. In this way, they endow the seemingly insignificant with profound meaning. Their task is to bring spacious stillness into the world while being absolutely present in whatever they do. They're in consciousness and therefore quality in what they do, even the simplest task. Uh, their purpose is to do everything in a sacred manner. As each human being is an integral part of the collective human consciousness they affect the world much more deeply than is visible on the surface of their lives. The new earth is no utopia. Wow. We learn this by page 307. You can't judge a book by its cover. Oh, literally. A new earth is no utopia. He ends with that. Damn, man. Is the notion of a new earth not just another utopian vision? Not at all. Not all utopian visions have this in common. The mental projection of a future time when all will be well, we will be saved, there will be peace and harmony, and the end of our problems. There have been many such utopian visions. Some ended in disappointment, others in disaster. Some people are already experiencing the end of the world across the planet. It's not just a video game. It's reality. At the core of all utopian visions lies one of the main structural dysfunctions of the old consciousness looking to the future for salvation. I love this. The only existence the future actually has is as a thought form in your mind. So when you look to the future for salvation, you are consciously looking to your own mind for salvation. You are trapped in form, and that is ego. 
The biblical prophet writes, quote, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The foundation for a new earth is a new heaven, the awakened consciousness within. The earth, external reality, is only an outer reflection. The horizon of a new heaven, and by implication, a new earth, are not future events. They're not physical events. They're going to make us free. Nothing is going to make us free because the only present moment can make us free. That realizing is the awakening. Awakening is a future event, has no meaning because awakening is the realization of presence. So the new heaven, the awakened consciousness, is not a future state to be achieved. A new heaven and a new earth are arising within you at this moment, and if they are not arising at this moment, they are no more than a thought in your head, and therefore not arising at all. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Heaven is right here in the midst of you. Heaven is right here in the midst, in the midst of you, in the midst of you, within you, within you, within you. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes a prediction that to this day few people have understood. He says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. In modern versions of the Bible, meek is translated as humble. Who are the meek or the humble? And what does it mean that they shall inherit the earth? The meek are the egoless. They are those who have awakened to their essential true nature as consciousness and recognize that essence in all others in life forms. They live in the surrendered state and so fill their oneness with the whole and the source. They embody the awakened consciousness and that is changing all aspects of life on our planet, including nature, because life on earth is inseparable from the human consciousness that perceives and interacts with it. That is the sense in which the meek will inherit the earth. A new species is arising on the planet. It is arising now, and you are it. And I am Alex Ansary signing off. That was that was a reading session, and it flowed way, way easier for me than reading a lot of the Gnostic texts, the hypostasis, the archons, and a lot of modern language. It's a book that a lot of you have already heard about. It's a lot of people that might be allergic to some ideas. They, they might be really into Ed Cartol, but I'm also help bridging the gap between what's happening in the physical world and the spiritual and the very things that he's talking about. If you appreciate this and you want to support this channel, first of all, subscribe, hit the red bell, but also check out the links down below. Until next time, I'm Alex Ansary, reminding you the path to the ultimate truth and place of power still lies within.